Bom dia a todos e todas. Eu vou falar em inglês. A gente vai esperar um pouco para que a, a computador comece. I've got a, a message to you from the future, and it's this. Cities are key to our survival. If we get our cities right, if we design them properly, we just might make it over the next hundred years. If we get them wrong, we're doomed. Look, everybody here knows that cities are dual-edged. On the one side, cities are these marvels of economic, political, and social engineering. If you live in a city, if you live in a city like Sao Paulo, even if you live in a favela, you're likely to be healthier, wealthier, better educated, live longer, and even on average, be happier than your country cousins. But cities have their problems. Cities concentrate crime, inequality, pollution. In cities, you also can see an uh, enormous amount of dependence on energy. More than 80% of the world's energy is consumed in cities. And over 82% of the world's carbon emissions also come from cities. But there's another problem, and it's that in spite of all the talk about cities, in spite of all the excitement about mega cities and are hip, we're almost hypnotized by their growth, we don't actually know what's happening in the vast majority of the world's cities, especially those cities in the global south, in Africa and Asia, where 90% of all future urban growth is set to take place in the next 20 years. Why this gap? Why this blind spot? Well, part of the problem, I think, is that we still see the world through the lens of these guys, of nation states. We're still trapped in a parochial 17th century idea of national sovereignty. Think about it. We put our national diplomats in charge of meeting our global affairs on behalf of these big, cumbersome social and political institutions. The problem, though, is that these nation states, well, they're in decline. They're in decline because of globalization from above, runaway technology from below, and as a result, our nation states are unable or unwilling to deal with some of the biggest global challenges of our time, be it climate change, pandemics, migration, terrorism, accelerating technology. I think it's potentially more useful to see the world through the lens of cities. The world has changed. We live in an urban era. We are homo urbanus. And the statistics are remarkable. When nation states first burst onto the scene in the 1600s, less than 1% of the world's population lived in a city. By the 1800s, early 1800s, we're talking about 3, 4, 5% of the world's population. By the early 20th century, less than 20% of the world lived in cities. And today, it's over 54% of the world's population resides in a city. By 2050, it'll be over 75%. We've never seen urban growth on this scale before. To explain some of the opportunities and threats that are facing our urban world, I'm going to be drawing on this data visualization that we finally got up. This was created by Carnegie Mellon's Create Lab, together with the Instituto Igarapé, based here in Brazil, and a whole consortium of other actors. It's called Earth Time. And actually, you can download it right now on your mobile phones at earthtime.org. It was launched yesterday for Earth Day, so it's publicly available in our goal to make this kind of data available to all. What we've done is we've taken anthropomorphic and climactic data, and we've layered it on top of 30 years of high-resolution satellite data. There are dozens of filters on looking at social economic transformation, climate change, violence, pollution, you name it. So you can play with all the filters as you like. This right here is a composite index of city fragility. It shows every single city in the world with a population of 250,000 people or more. It has 11 indicators, ranging from income inequality to unemployment to pollution to exposure to floods, cyclones, and droughts, and creates a score. And without going into too much technical detail, the redder and the bigger the circle, the more fragile that city is to tipping over. The bluer and the smaller the circle is, the more resilient. And what you've got here is 15 years of time series data. 
One thing is for certain, in spite of all of these blind gaps about cities, and it's that cities are growing in power and influence. Just take the case of Sao Paulo right here. Sao Paulo, this powerhouse, this engine of growth, has a GDP of $477 billion a year. If Sao Paulo was a country, it would be the 27th largest country in the world. Its economy, Sao Paulo's economy, is bigger than the economy of Thailand, of Iran, of Nigeria. But we don't think of Sao Paulo in those terms. Rio de Janeiro, where I live, although I suspect the figures have changed in the last couple of years, had a GDP a couple of years ago of about $305 billion. The second biggest city in Brazil has also got an economy that's bigger than that of Singapore, of Pakistan, of Chile, of Portugal. Even Curitiba, down south, is no slouch. It's got a GDP of about $14.3 billion, which makes it bigger than Jamaica, than Nicaragua, than Namibia. Now, these cities, Sao Paulo, Rio, Curitiba, they're punching way above their weight economically. They're bohemus. But they're still pulling their punches politically. And that's going to have to change if we, if you, are going to deal with some of the biggest challenges that we face today. Of course, not all cities are the same. Some cities are more fragile than others. What we see right now is a general deepening of fragility around the world, but a real deepening in those parts of the world that are urbanizing the fastest, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South and Southeast Asia. About 14% of the world's medium to large cities fall into this high fragility category, and the tendency is for them to increase. Most of those cities are in low and middle income countries, it has to be said. But not all cities are fragile. There's also a, a large number of cities that are increasingly resilient. Western Europe, for example, parts of Australasia and Canada have seen only minor fluctuations in fragility, sometimes coming in, sometimes coming out. And you can see in southeastern Europe, in the Balkans in particular, a deepening of fragility. About 7% of the world's cities fall in this low, fragile category. Now, North America gives us more of a mixed picture. There are not that many cities, as you can see in Canada, where I'm from, with populations of more than 250,000 people. Uh, so there aren't actually that many cities. But the point here is that it's much more mixed. You see a combination of medium to low, sometimes high, fragile cities across the United States. Cities like Detroit, Baltimore, New Orleans, Norfolk, Virginia, they really stand out for deepening forms of fragility. So the point here is that North American cities are hardly immune. About 60% of the world's cities fall into this middle category, including right down here in Brazil. Brazil's situation is pretty mixed. It's not as dire as you might think. There are two mega cities in Brazil, two huge bohemia cities, notably Sao Paulo and Rio. But the vast majority of action isn't actually at the mega city scale. There are actually 10 cities in Brazil with more than a million people. There are 22 cities with more than 500,000 people. There are 1,400 cities in Brazil with 10,000 people or more. And that's where the vast majority of urbanization is taking place. Not in Sao Paulo, Rio, Fortaleza, Natal, cities that we all know and are hypnotized by, but in these smaller, medium-sized cities, that's where the action is. And that, frankly, is where the action is around the world when it comes to urbanization. And what we see is a deepening of fragility in some parts of Brazil, notably in the north and east. Brazilian cities are a kind of prototype a kind of harbinger of what's to come. That's because Brazilian cities grew incredibly quickly, and we're seeing similar growth rates in Africa and Asia to what we've seen in Brazil. Brazil has more or less gone through the majority of its urban transition. Roughly 85% of Brazil, Brazilians currently live in cities. It might get to about 90%, a little bit over 90% in the coming decades, but that massive growth is, is taken place. It hasn't yet taken place in Africa and Asia, which represents both, obviously, opportunities and challenges. What you see here is all light emitted from space over a 25-year period. You'll see here, essentially, that the red areas are those areas that have grown the fastest, primarily in urban areas. So China, parts of Russia, India, Southeast Asia, and a little bit of the coasts of Latin America have grown. <clears throat> You'll also see massive dark spots where we don't have connectivity, where we don't have massive urbanization, notably in the center of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as parts of the Amazon. In Latin America, as all of you know, coast is king. 
90% of the region's population is tucked along a narrow strip along the coastline. And that has enormous implications for how we think about the future of our cities. Now, Sao Paulo, as all of you know, lights up the map. This is America's Goliath, the largest city, not just in Latin America, but in the entire hemisphere. We've got more than 21 million people in the wider metropolitan area. And we've never seen cities like this. We've never seen this kind of growth. These are new forms of urban morphology that simply didn't exist in the past. Now, Sao Paulo has experienced massive growth, and I don't need to tell that to an audience full of people of Paulistas. Uh, but for those of you who are new or relatively new to this area, in the last 30 years, Sao Paulo has experienced a dramatic expansion in size. In fact, it took New York City about 150 years to reach 8.5 million people. Sao Paulo reached that interval in less than 25 years. So just to give you a sense of the monumental speed, the kind of turbo urbanization associated with growth in Sao Paulo. As a result, Sao Paulo has, in a way, urbanized before large parts of it have industrialized. And that's created enormous strains on physical, social, and economic assets. It's also created massive informal areas. Cities across Brazil and throughout Latin America are characterized by their informalization that are, in a way, not necessarily spatially off the map, but in other ways are. This is mesmerizing. I mean, the growth of Sao Paulo itself is, is, is mesmerizing. But I think, as I've mentioned, urbanization of the future is not going to look so much like Sao Paulo. It's going to look more like Campos. Urbanization is going to be less spectacular, but much larger in terms of people moving from rural areas to small towns and small towns to middle-sized cities. Not as exciting, not as hypnotic, but probably more relevant. Campos is actually Brazil's fastest growing city. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the world at about 3%. What we're seeing in Campos is a growing sprawl, a stretching out of the city, taking up an ever larger area of land around it. And I'll come back to the issue of sprawl. Now, Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, the relatively recent capital of Brazil, uh, was al is also growing at breakneck speed. And we haven't seen cities grow like this in many other parts of the world. This spectacular marvel, this dream of Lucia Costa and Oscar Niemeyer is also Brazil's second fastest growing city. This population of roughly 214,000 people in the downtown area of Brasilia is now being superseded by over 2.9 million people who've been spreading out in its periphery. And for those of you who know Brasilia, you know that there's a vast variation in terms of the standard of living from the center to the periphery, even within just a couple of kilometers. But Brazil's urbanization, probably the biggest challenges really, is about uncontrolled urbanization, urbanization that isn't planned in the spectacular ways of, say, Brasilia, but urbanization along the lines of what we see in places like Manaus. Manaus is also one of Brazil's fastest growing cities at about 2.8% per year, much faster than the global average. Now, this generates enormous stresses, not just on the physical assets, but also on the environmental uh, assets outside of the city, as we see large areas being cleared to make way for ever-growing populations. A similar trend is underway in Belém. Cities like Belém are doubling their size in 25-year intervals with catastrophic results. Again, not just on the physical and the environmental, but also on the social fabric of these societies. When you have that kind of movement into a city, you have an enormous amount of what we call social disorganization. And that can create enormous stress on social capital, as well as social cohesion, and what we call social efficacy, the ability of people to regulate each other and one another's behaviors. As a result of this social disorganization from this kind of runaway growth, Belém is one of the most violent cities in Brazil, and possibly one of the most violent in the world. In fact, Brazil has 22 of the 50 most violent cities measured by homicide in the world. And a lot of that has to do with the state and movement of urbanization. A perfect example of this is Marseille. Marseille's population has exploded in population terms. Most of it, though, not in the downtown core, but in slums towards the north and northwest of the city, as you'll see on this map. And levels of crime in Marseille are off the charts. It's regularly listed as one of the top five most violent cities in Brazil, and is up there with San Salvador, Caracas, 
and, and San Pedro Sula as among the most violent cities in the world. Now, it's not just turbo urbanization that's generating stresses and risks for our cities around the world. Carbon emissions are a major, major issue. Cities are responsible, as I mentioned, for more than 80% of the world's carbon emissions. Most of this comes from industrial pollution, it comes from car emissions, but also from forest fires. What you see here is a Japanese satellite, a cluster of Japanese satellites, that's capturing fires from space over a three-year period. And a couple of things stand out here. First of all, what you'll see are these blooms above and below the equator, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of southeastern Asia. This is really due to slash and burn agriculture, as sedentary populations literally are burning land for the green shoots to grow to allow food for, pasture, for, for livestock. It's also due to biomass uh, and other forms of burning. You'll also see some fixed fires, not just sporadic fires, but areas of concentrated fire. And that has to do with basically gas flares, industrial areas, coal factories, steel factories, and the like. Cities are badly affected by this. You might think this is a rural problem or this is a peri-urban problem, but what we're seeing increasingly around the world are cities literally being asphyxiated, suffocated by these kinds of plumes. Just in this last year, cities in Delhi, uh, cities in, in India, like New Delhi, or in Beijing in China, had road traffic chaos because of smog coming in from biomass burning in the rural hinterland. Pollution is now one of the single largest causes of premature death for young people in these countries. So this is, may seem like a problem that's remote from you, but is deeply interconnected to your well-being. Carbon emissions are generated from coal factories, steel plants, petrochemical factories, and the like. And what you see here is an industrial park in Vitoria, in Spiritu Santo. Well, it's a major clustering of gas flares. This is equivalent of tens of thousands of cars on the road every single year. And it's not just carbon, which is bad, but it's methane, which is infinitely worse than carbon, that we're seeing being spewed. And there is not really a public conversation about this. There is this kind of expression we have of out of sight, out of mind. What I'm going to show you here are gas flares that are off the coast of Rio de Janeiro. This is um, in the pre-salt areas, which everyone here knows are among the largest offshore reserves of oil and gas on the planet. Many, many extractive industries involved here. I'm not going to pick on one. I'm just taking a random cluster. These are gas flares. This is burn-off from gas flares off the coast. This has enormous implications for our climate, but it's also hugely expensive. Just these gas flares in the pre-salt fields amount to losses of $250 million a year, literally poof, up in smoke. And it's not just an offshore problem. As we see gas and oil and gas exploration moving also inshore, as well as refineries that are based across Brazil, we see these clusters. And what you're seeing here is Itagui. This is a cluster of refineries and processing areas. And you'll see this kind of action all across Brazil and, of course, around the world but not really part of the public conversation, sort of left to one side. The sheer scale of these forest fires in Brazil is literally breathtaking. What you see here in Brazil, like we saw in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia, is a kind of slash and burn, sort of seasonal episodic burns that are really about releasing land for both urbanization as well as for agricultural production. Rodonia, Mato Grosso, Tocatin, Pará, Maranhão, these are the states that are really on the front lines, but it's not limited to those states that span the Amazon. It's also down as far south as, Man as, as Minas Gerais and down the Rio Grande do Sul. To understand how this is human-induced, what I want to show you here are all of the parks and protected areas across Brazil. This includes reserves, monuments, biological refuges, there are about 1,800 different protected areas across Brazil, covering more than 150 million acres of this country, which is an incredibly enlightened and wise set of social policies. And what you can see here is that fires generally don't take place inside those protected areas. And this gives some cause for hope amidst the doom and gloom that actually social policy, enlightened social policy, green policies can make a real difference. But it's not always the case. As you zoom in, and I can zoom in at a much higher resolution, I'd encourage you to do it on your own phones or, or laptops. Here's Roraima, and you can see that the fires pass into parks periodically. So while we have these protected areas, they're not necessarily inhibiting encroachments, legal or illegal. And remember, the Amazon is the world's largest terrestrial sink, processing 
hundreds of millions of metric tons of carbon every single year. And we have two challenges with these kinds of issues right now, these kinds of unrelenting burns. First, it reduces the absorptive capacity of existing forests to be able to capture carbon and process it. But second, we're also generating more carbon with vast consequences for our world. So it's a vicious cycle with massive consequences for Brazil and our planet. What you see here is land that's going to be converted over a, a period into agricultural products, primarily soy, sugar, uh, as well as land for, for cattle and pasture to graze. This food, of course, is feeding growing population centers in Brazil, but it's also feeding emerging economies, of course, as all of you know, from China uh, and throughout Asia to around the world. But it's having a dramatic effect, not just in terms of releasing carbon, but also permanently affecting groundwater and surface water reserves. We are reaching potentially irreversible tipping points that can affect transpiration rates of water from across the Amazon to our cities. Right now, more than 850 cities, recall that there are 1,400 cities with populations of 10,000 people or more, 850 cities in Brazil are currently affected by chronic water shortages. And all of you can remember in Sao Paulo, and I remember from Rio, when our water reserves were reaching dangerously low levels to the point where we were rationing water, D-Day was fast approaching, which suggests to us that the situation that we're seeing right now in Cape Town, where they're facing a prolonged drought and possibly running out of water entirely, may become less the exception and more the norm. Now, Roraima is just the tip of the iceberg. That this is happening in Brazil and in places like Roraima is perverse because Brazil has also 20% of the world's fresh water reserves. What you're seeing right here is net deforestation over a 14, uh, over 16 year period. Um, areas that are red are where we're seeing a net loss of forests. Areas that are blue, which you can't see very much of, but imply a net gain. And pink is some combination of the two. Cities are part of the problem when it comes to these deforestation, both because of consumption, but also their expanding size. But cities, as I've mentioned, are also on the front lines. As we see these forests come down, as we see carbon being emitted, as we see fires, we're also seeing problems to population health in some of our urban cores that seem like they're far away. Now, carbon and methane, of course, heats the planet. The heating and melting of glaciers, as all of you know, is upsetting rainfall patterns and contributing to rising sea levels. As a result, we're seeing dramatic changes in levels of seas, tidal patterns, and storm surges, and extreme weather events. This is really bad news for cities, because two-thirds of the world's cities are coastal. More than 1.5 billion people live within 100 kilometers of the water. And the latest predictions suggest that up to a billion people are going to be forced to move as a result of extreme climate events within the next 30 to 40 years. What you see here are projected changes in temperature between 0 and 4 degrees in the bottom left corner of the screen. Recall that the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement set a 2 degrees Celsius threshold as its upper limit. At 2 degrees Celsius, megacities like Shanghai are going to be really in trouble. At 4 degrees Celsius, cities like Shanghai of 24 million people are going to be literally underwater. And Shanghai is hardly alone. Bangkok, Osaka, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, all these cities are facing very similar predicaments. But this isn't just a problem for small islands, Pacific states, or South and Southeast Asia. Amsterdam, London, but especially the eastern United States are on the front line. At 2 degrees Celsius, Miami goes underwater. At 4 degrees Celsius, the entire south tip of Florida disappears. Now, some people in Miami consider this to be the new normal. They say, well, such is life. The reality, though, is that city authorities in Miami are slipping into panic mode. They're already issuing Miami Forever bonds to try to generate funds for water pipes, to build sea berms, to build break walls, and to introduce mitigation, to introduce wetland restoration, and all sorts of mitigation events. The fact of the matter is that Miami is going under, as is the vast majority of the Gulf all the way up towards southern New York. Now, this city's in trouble. It's built on porous limestone. So no amount of break wall that you build is going to keep the water from seeping out. But there's an irony here that may not be lost on some of you, which is that Mar-a-Lago, the winter White House, the home of the climate denier-in-chief, 
it may be the first place to go. But this is not a time for schadenfreude. Brazil is also on the front line. More than 60% of all Brazil cities are exposed to the threats of rising sea levels. What you see here is all critical infrastructure for oil and gas, electricity, and fiber optics in Brazil. You'll see that a lot of it's clustered on the coast, precisely because of the offshore reserves, uh, as well as the urbanization patterns in Brazil. Virtually no studies have been done to examine what the impacts of water sea level rise are going to be on these areas. But let's go through a couple of cities and see what the implications might be, because I suspect that might be uppermost in your minds. Cities like Porto Alegre in Rio Grande do Sul are really deeply in trouble. There are 1.4 million people living in this city in the south, yet few of these cities, including Porto Alegre, have set up a, da a disaster reduction plan. Instead, like so many other mayors around the world and other leaders, they're kicking the can down the road, hoping that future generations will look after this challenge. But this is a problem for today, not for tomorrow. This is Florianopolis. Small coastal cities like Florianopolis and Santa Catarina are also exposed. And it's not just people that are going to be forced to move. We're talking housing, infrastructure, critical infrastructure, as well as permanent effects in terms of land salinization, making previously arable land unusable. Santos, the jewel of the shipping empire in Brazil, the largest port in all of Latin America is also on the front line. The latest estimate for the impact of sea level rise in Santos within the next 20 years is equivalent of $2 billion in losses. Rio de Janeiro, home of sun, surf, and sand, and so much more, some of the most valued real estate on the planet is also going to be on the front line. And of course, large numbers of people who are living squeezed up against the coastal areas are not necessarily the wealthy and well-heeled, but really the poorest, the most vulnerable. And they're the ones who are likely to suffer first and suffer the most. And it's not just the coastal areas necessarily. You can also go inland. This is an area of Magé, which is one of the key distribution nodes for oil and gas along an axis between Rio and Sao Paulo. And you see what happens as water begins to rise and take out critical infrastructure. Salvador, with its historic cities in Bahia, an enormous behemoth city pummeled by rising water levels. It's a key artery and a gateway into the north and the northeast. Also is going to be similarly affected. Recife in Pernambuco. One study that's been done in Recife suggests that we could see anywhere between 2.6 and 6 feet of sea level rise in the coming decades. Storm surges are going to put large parts of the city of 3.7 million people at acute risk. Fortaleza in Serra, seen as one of the hubs for future transport and certainly for fiber optics, it's also going to be hit. It also happens, by the way, to be one of the most violent cities in Brazil, due in large part to that rapid urbanization I was mentioning before. And of course, Belém. Belém, tucked in in the Amazonas, seemingly away from the rising sea levels, is also going to be affected by tidal surges. Uh, fast urbanizing cities, which are the norm in Brazil, are the ones that are going to be potentially hit the hardest. Now, I've given a bit of doom and gloom here. I want to perhaps talk a bit about solutions. The panorama is not all bad. There are many, many good news stories. And cities are starting to take note. Cities, in many ways, are on the front lines leading the charge to rethink and reimagine our world. So let's talk about cities. City leaders, almost by definition, are pragmatic. As they say in North America or in the US, a pothole is not a Republican problem. It's not a democratic problem. It's a problem for all. And I think that's often the, the mentality that we'll see mayors take to the table. City leaders tend to be more accountable, specifically because they are directly connected to their citizenry, often on the streets in the neighborhoods where they live. And this proximity helps keep municipal level leaders, in many cases, honest. There are a couple of strategies that stand there, and I'm just going to reflect on a few of them. The first strategy for essentially planning resilience and building resilience into our cities is to set a plan and to stick with that plan. It's obvious. This is not about high-tech wizardry. This is not about AI. This is not about <laughs> some new innovation. This is a basic requirement of cities. But what's amazing is how few cities actually have a basic plan and a vision to guide them into the future. Everybody wants a smart city. Everybody wants to have a creative and a happy city. The question is, how do you get there? And a plan with goals, with targets, with metrics, is absolutely essential. Without it, you are literally flying blind. And these plans can't just sit idle on the shelf. 
It's not enough to make a master plan and come back to it in 50 years. They have to be renewed. They have to be updated. You need to build in the consultative mechanisms to get people to engage. The plan has to account not just for the physical infrastructure, but also the social and the digital spine of cities. A good example of how to do this right actually comes from Curitiba, a city that we saw earlier. Curitiba in the 1970s had a slogan, city for all. And inclusivity was in the very center of the plan. Long before issues of inequality and equality became in vogue, inclusivity was the buzzword. The master plan, which was actually written in 1965, has been updated routinely. It's not perfect. Curitiba is far from perfect, but offers, I think, some interesting ideas. It teaches us two really basic lessons. The first is continuity. It's not enough to have a plan, and every four to five years, jettison it and come up with a new plan. Successive mayors need to be able to double down on that plan, upgrade it, renew it, put their stamp on it, sure, but you can't just let it sit and throw it out. The second lesson is the importance of autonomy and discretion. Cities, because of the power of nation states, haven't often had that political clout to be able to take the hard decisions, make the tough calls. But cities need discretion. They need the power to be able to issue debt, to raise taxes, to enter into public-private partnerships, to sometimes defy public opinion when necessary. And that may require a renegotiation of the relationship between cities in this urban era of ours and nation states. Second lesson, go green. Cities have an extraordinary power to reduce their carbon footprints. And cities are already doing that. We're seeing cities investing in carbon emission standards. Cities are building with new smart materials. Cities are developing congestion pricing schemes to reduce the likelihood of cars in the street. They're incentivizing green areas and building parks. They're investing in walkways and bikeways. And this is excellent. We need more of this. In fact, right now, there are more than 8,000 cities around the world that have installed solar power capacity that actually flows onto the main grid. There are over 1,000 cities with municipal hydroelectric plants, and there are 300 cities that are on the cusp of being completely energy autonomous. The way not to do it is Kubatau. This, as many of you know, is known as the Valley of Death. It's a major series of industrial parks that are encircled by mountains, which haven't allowed air to be able to move. And populations, although it's marginally improved, face major uh, population health challenges. A better example comes from the south, where we have windmills, but all, and the north, but also from Guayana, and even Serra. Both of them are investing in major solar parks. Brazil already has huge investments in hydroelectric. More than 80% of the entire energy grid runs off them. These are often inefficient in many cases and have huge human costs. More than 1.2 million Brazilians have been forced off their land because of the building of these massive hydroelectric plants. But cities in Brazil and around the world are starting to come up with a more mixed energy grid, investing in solar, wind, hydro, and biomass. And together, cities are also setting standards. And there are real opportunities here to harness this green economy at the metropolitan level. This doesn't only reduce the carbon footprint in cities and make them healthier to live in, but they also make them more attractive for foreign and local investment. Just a note of caution, we've got to watch the hydro. Obviously, there are limits to how, much we, how far down we go down that track. Brazil has more than 84 large-scale hydroelectric plants. This has, as all of you know, major impacts on, obviously, the environment. Um, and it's resulted in massive population displacement. We might need to start rethinking some of our dams and think about smaller, decentralized, more metropolitan-scale investments on hydro. This can reduce the impact and offers enormous opportunities. Third lesson, cities need to build densely and compactly. They've got to build up rather than out. This means getting the balance right, because cities also have to know when not to build, so as not to reproduce the vertical sprawls that we see in parts of Sao Paulo, or areas of downward mobility and concentrated poverty. Londrina has not quite got the balance right. You can see that it's spreading. It's one of the fastest spreading cities. And this dispersion is bad for the environment, but it's also bad for social cohesion, because a dispersed city often leads to a disorganized and a separate and a segmented city. It can create and setify inequalities within communities. Blumenau, which for many people in the room perhaps is a, known for its Oktoberfest and is a quaint city planned in the 1850s, uh, also hasn't quite got it right. While a beautiful city in many ways, with a population of just 334,000 people, Blumenau has actually spread out. It was ranked as the most sprawling city in Brazil 
five years ago. Now, most people are spreading out in Blumenau to avoid potential flooding, but this is not a model to follow. Surprisingly, next door, a better model to follow is Maringa, the song city in Paraná, which is doing a much better job. Maringa was founded in 1947. It's got about 400,000 people today, about 760,000 plus minus in the entire municipality. And it was ranked as the most dense city in Brazil. And this wasn't by accident. Maringa set up in the 1990s a rethinking Maringa strategy. And it really emphasized civil society, multi-stakeholder engagement to come up with a plan. Fourth, the most successful cities are those that are not going to solve one problem, but are going to solve multiple ones. We need to do much more with much less. Integrated public transport is a great way to look at this. Integrated public transport reduces congestion, but it does much more than that. It can improve health because people start using bikes and walking. It can reduce dispersion because it brings cities together. It can make cities safer because transport becomes more predictable. Accessible transport is more than just having the infrastructure, build it and they will come. It's also about having incentives to get people to start using public infrastructure. Sao Paulo has not quite got there yet. It has the smallest metro network of any large city in the world. It has just 70 kilometers, 70 plus minus kilometers of metro. Compare that to 200 kilometers for Mexico, or 400 kilometers in the case of Seoul. This creates, as all of you know, massive gridlock, huge emissions, and it's one of the reasons why Sao Paulo has some of the worst traffic in Brazil. Now, Curitiba sort of figured things out once again. In the 1970s, Curitiba came up with this innovation of the bus rapid transit. Over the last 30 years, Curitiba's population has actually grown fourfold to almost 2 million people. And yet the size of the city over that same period hasn't really increased in the same way. Why? Well, part of the reason is that 1.6 million people of those 2 million use public transport every single day. Public transport using rapid bus transit is 50 times less expensive than rail. And with electric buses, 74% more efficient than using other alternatives. The city's also created a network, a lattice of white bikeways and walkways, which has made it one of the greenest cities, and in the process, a model for the world. The key is to avoid the uncontrolled cities of the future. Brazil has a lot of choices to make. It needs to invest in planning, and I would argue that's one of the, the key lessons. 10 of the 20 fastest cities in Brazil, growing cities in Brazil right now are in the Amazon. Cities like Paraúapebas that depend on mineral extraction, in this case, iron ore, they're not so much the exception as increasingly the rule. And the question, I think, for Brazil is this, do we have the wisdom to plan ahead? So let me conclude. Cities need to work together in global coalitions. They need to pool their voices and resources. Cities, until quite recently, have been left out of national and certainly international decision making. Cities, though, need the power, the discretion, the autonomy to take decisions. And this means renegotiating relationships with their federal authorities. But it also means working coalitions. Today, there are more than 200 intercity coalitions around the world that are amplifying city voice. There's the Federação de Prefectos aqui no Brasil, here in Brazil, which unites mayors from across the country to, to raise their voice. But there's also international groups, like the C40, ICLE, UCLG, the Global Parliament of Mayors, and others. What these global coalitions do is they accelerate decision making and they accentuate the city voice at the national stage. But they also help cities leapfrog old technologies and adopt new ones. Cities are constantly stealing ideas one from the other. So at this moment, precisely when our nation states are on the rocks and receding, and when our international institutions seem to be unable to deal with some of the biggest global challenges of our day, it's cities and city leaders who are stepping up to solve some of our most intractable problems. It's because cities are open, diverse, and creative that they're able to help trigger not just a renewal in sustainability, but a renewal in democratic action. Cities have a potential to be an antidote to a lot of the reactionary nationalism and populism that we're seeing around the world. So how do we future-proof our cities? We think globally, and we empower our cities right here at home. Thanks.